All right, let's begin. This is a little video that will hopefully help you on your take home quiz number four. Um, it's a little bit on recombination mapping, which you will have to do on that quiz. And we didn't really talk about it much in class. So here goes. Um, just to give you the whole big picture, to start off, really what we're doing here is we're calculating the recombination frequencies between two different genes. The recombination frequency is calculated by this equation up on the board. RF, recombination frequency, is equals the number of recombinant offspring divided by the total number of offspring. And then you multiply that by 100 to give you your recombinant. It'll give you a percentage. So, uh, let's talk about what is the number of recombinants versus the total number of offspring. So here's a hypothetical cross. We're going to be working with four hypothetical genes, A, B, C, and D. In this cross, I'm going to take a female, which is XA, XA. So she has her two X chromosomes. Each one of them is carrying um, one mutant. One of them has mutant A, as seen here. One of them has mutant B, as seen here. So she's heterozygous for both of these respective mutations. Now, if we were to draw a Punnett square of this cross, uh, the Punnett square on the outside, we place the gametes, the possible gametes. The male is always going to be X plus Y because we're using a wild type male. The female, in most cases, we would draw this Punnett square and we would write X A, X B. Those are two possible gametes. This one being XA, this one being XB. However, because of the process of recombination, there are other gametes that are possible from the female. Now, just to let you know, recombination is not going to occur between the X and the Y in the male, so we don't consider recombination in the male at all. In fact, in fruit flies, recombination in males is virtually non-existent. So we can ignore it altogether. But it does occur in the females. So let me illustrate it here. Recombination would be when the gene, the chromosome arms get swapped. So they switch places. So if crossing over, uh, it's also called crossing over, if it occurred right here between these two genes, gene A and gene B, we would get two chromosomes that would look like this. Where this distal portion of the arm has been swapped. Notably, in this case, the bottom one is carrying both of the mutant genes now. Whereas this third one here is carrying no mutant genes. It is effectively wild type. So X plus and XAB. This extends our Punnett square. We can add two more columns. One for X plus, one for XAB. Now, you fill this Punnett square out. <clears throat> Let me back up. These two are called the recombinant chromosomes. Any offspring that ends up with these X chromosomes, either one of them, would be considered a recombinant offspring. Why? Because recombination occurred. <clears throat> so, I'm not going to concern myself with the females. They would all be wild type, so it wouldn't matter. If we're looking at the males. These two males are the non-recombinant offspring. These two males are the recombinant offspring. So as you guys did earlier, when you came in, if I were to come in and count these males, and let's say, hypothetically, I get 145 those guys, 134 of those, 
18 wild type and 24 with both mutants. Those are my counts. Now, theoretically, the non-recombinant offspring numbers should be pretty close together and the recombinant offspring numbers should be pretty close together. This is then the outcome. The whole idea here is, and this is important, the idea is the more, the, the closer two genes are together, the less frequently recombination will occur between them. That makes sense. There's not as much room between them for recombination to occur. So the lower the recombination frequency, the closer together the genes are. And that's how we will use we will use those recombination frequencies to build a map showing the relative locations of these genes. Now, continuing on with our AB example, how can we calculate the recombination frequency? Number of recombinants, which would be 18 plus 24, 42. The number of recombinants divided by the total number of offspring. The total number of offspring in this case is 321. I'm going to erase this over here. So between A and B, the recombination frequency, uh, when you run it through this, which would be 42 divided by 321 times 100, recombination frequency is 13%. Uh, they, this percentage directly correlates with uh, the map units, which is an arbitrary unit used to describe the distance between two things. So 13% recombination frequency is also 13 cent Morgan, named after Thomas Hunt Morgan. All right, so the distance between A and B is 13 I will for now on use sent to Morgan. Uh, I'm going to erase this now and throw up some hypothetical numbers that will allow us to build a map. So the recombination between A and D, the distance there is 9 sent to Morgan. Between B and D is 20. C and B is 3, and C and A is 15. Each of these numbers represents an entirely different cross, which you guys as students in, in the lab, you generated data from five separate crosses just like this. So how do we figure out where these are located in relation to each other? We can't find out their exact location, but we can find out how they are related to each other. I'm going to start off by drawing a long stretch of a chromosome. And pick a gene, any gene. You can start with any one. Let's say we start with uh, B, just for fun. Okay, so I'm going to stick B anywhere I want on this chromosome. I'm going to stick right here in the middle. With most of these questions, there are two possible answers. Uh, if I gave you more information, it would limit it to one possible answer. But as this information we have here, there are two possible answers. And they're just mere images of each other. So I'm going to just place B there in the middle. Now let's pick a second one. Let's use C. Because C, we can tell, is very close to B. I just, I could put C over here or over on that side. It wouldn't matter, but this would determine which of the answers you come up with, both of which are equally correct. I'm going to place C over here, and we know that this distance is approximately 3. Units being sent to Morgan, but I'm not writing those in. Alright, so this is where it gets a little more challenging. Uh, let's pick a different one. Let's pick A. A and B. So, we know that A is approximately 13 centimorgan away from B. That means it could go there, but you notice I've drawn it as a dotted line. 
because it could also be 13 centimorgan in this direction. So which one is it? Well, that's why we do all these different processes. Let's, um, let's use a hypothetical situation. Let's assume A is located over here. If A is over here, then the distance from C to A should be less than 13. Whoa, where does that come from? The distance from C to A should be less than 13 because the distance from B to A is 13. Contrarywise, over here, if it's over here, the distance from A to C would be greater than 13. So that, that's our hypothetical situation. Now immediately when you look over here, um, here's C and A. The distance between them is 15 centimorgan. So that rules out this guy right there. And it means A must be located um, on the opposite side of B. It's the only choice. Notice if A and B is 13, then A and C, just by simple math, should be 16, right? Well, unfortunately, that's rarely the case. In our example here, A and C is actually 15. And that's okay. In fact, in your textbook, you might end up with perfect examples where they add up just right. That's rarely the, uh, the case in real life as you guys will find out from the real data that you generated. You won't find perfect addition. Um, all right, let's find out where D goes. So let's pick any of these crosses that use D. We'll use A in D. We know that D is located nine centimorgan away from A. So it could be about right here or it could be the other direction. Right there. So which one is right? Well, we need another comparison for D. So let's see. Right here. B and D. D is 20 centimorgan away from B. So let's build a hypothetical situation. Assuming that D is located right here. That would put it very close to B. In fact, we would say that the distance between D and B should be smaller than the distance between A and B. Whereas, if D is located on the far side, the distance between D and B should be larger than the distance between D and A. Look back at our data, and what do we have? The distance between B and D is in fact larger than the distance between B and A. That tells us this far location is the correct spot for D. So there you have it. That's a recombination map showing the relative location of these genes. One more notice. The distance between A and D is 9 centimorgan. 9 plus 13, that's 22. So by simple addition, the distance between D and B should be 22. But according to our data, the distance between D and B is actually just 20. Remember, the numbers are not going to add up. And that's actually more accurate than false numbers that actually added because there are factors um, known as interference and double crossing over that um, obscure these numbers. So the numbers that you have in your data is actually more accurate to real life than some generic numbers that often appear in textbooks. Hopefully this will help you as you approach quiz number four and I will see you next week.